Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted uh, today to invite you to a conversation with um, Elżbieta Wiernik. Um, Elżbieta is um, a lady uh, who uh, went through um, the trial of Anders during the Second World War as a child. And she has a very fascinating story about uh, her, um, her life and uh, about what have happened. Um, we also would uh, like her to give us a little bit of a background about why, um, uh, why she ended up being here in England and um, how come that so many people from Poland have emigrated and have stayed in England after the war. Um, this is the event of Polish Sioux within the Polish Heritage Days. Um, so uh, Elżbieta, um, I will be delighted to have a, a conversation with you and, and um, ask many questions. But first of all, I would like to um, ask you to introduce yourself um, and just tell us a little bit uh, of, a back, of your background uh, and what you do now. Um, and then we can move on and we can have a, a, a free conversation. Yes, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, what I do now is actually connected. I'm, I'm retired now. Um, so I have lots of time actually to do the voluntary work and uh, I do it in Ognisko Polskie. And the Ognisko Polskie or the Polish hearth is actually part of the story. It's part of the history. It's part of the story. It's part of the uh, story of Anders and the generals and everything that, that, that's come since and went before. Um, so um, just briefly, um, I'll go back a little bit to the history of, of what happened um, in 1939. Um, I think most people will know that uh, Poland was invaded by Germany, um, but not everybody knows that actually Poland was also invaded by the Russians, by the Soviets. Um, and my parents actually came from the part of Poland uh, that was invaded by the Germans. My father was in Bydgoszcz when the war broke out. He was an architect and he was a chief town planner in Bydgoszcz when the war broke out. And um, he was told, and unfortunately, a lot of people did lose their lives in Bydgoszcz. The uh, Germans had a long list of people they arrested as soon as they came in and they were shot. Um, and luckily somebody told him he was on the list. And so he got out, um, literally with nothing, and went to Lwów which then was a Polish city. It is now, I expect you've heard a lot about it because it's Lviv now. Of course. And it's in the Ukraine, yeah. yes. And again, another part of history. At that time, it actually was Poland. Um, and he had friends there. So uh, he just left, basically. He had his mother and three sisters uh, still still sort of in, 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 at home, but um, mm. he escaped. Now, my mother, uh, when the war broke out, she was near Torun, again, in Western, in Western Poland. And uh, she uh, signed up to uh, train as a nurse. You know, obviously the war was starting and they were going to need to have, I mean, she, had, she hadn't been a nurse before, but, but uh, at that time um, they, were, they were asking for volunteers to sign up and to be trained. And uh, the hospital that she was going to be trained in was actually moved to Wolf as well, out of the, out of the, uh, you know, ahead of the Germans. Mm. Um, so uh, they actually had mutual friends uh, in Wolf, which, I mean, they, they vaguely knew about each other before that, but they actually met at these mutual friends and it was a lightning romance. And uh, they decided to get married, particularly as the war was coming. And, uh, which they did in Wolf in the, in, in the cathedral there. Um, but before that, my mother, actually, my father didn't take any papers with him at all. Um, he just went as he was. Um, so uh, she said that she would go back. Now, there was what was called Zielona Granica, a green boundary between the German and the, and the Russians. Um, so you had to cross that to get into the German part so that she could go to um, his family, to his mother, and get the papers that they needed so they could get married. And um, also, she wanted to meet his family. I mean, they hadn't, you know, so at least they knew who, who he was marrying. Of course. Um, so um, she went and she stayed there, I think, for, I think it was just under two weeks she was there. 
she got the papers and then my another little aside how my aunt actually ended up in the same situation my aunt my my father's um, sister said oh you came over so easily you had no problem coming over I'll go back I, I want to see Stefan my father's name was Stefan um, I'd love to see him um, I'll, I'll just come back and she did this literally on the station I mean <laughs> my family seemed to have this habit of just going off somewhere so she actually went back to Lvov with my mother um, and uh, did get a message somehow to 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 to, to her mother and um to say, look, this is where I am. I, I, I'll be coming home soon. And she never did because, well, she did eventually. Um, but on the way back, um, you had to actually have a guide to take you across the the, 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 the uh, boundary. And uh, he actually, um, well, you know, you had to pay for it. It wasn't that they did it for nothing. Mm. But he. Um, uh, told the Russians about this group that he was taking oh, no. back. So he was a confident uh, um, sort of the, so, of the Russians. Uh, so the group was arrested. So my aunt was actually arrested my and she didn't go to Siberia. She, well, she, she went through the same. She, she joined the army afterwards, but um, she was put into prison as a spy, <laughs> which she absolutely wasn't. But that's a mm. different story. Mm. So there were those two two members of my family who actually did join the army when the Germans attacked the Russians and the Russians became our allies. And, uh, you know, uh, the government in exile here said you've got not only soldiers that, were, you know, the Russians were holding in, 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 in camps, but all these civilians because there were, uh, well, you know, I think nearly half a million were taken actually yeah. to the camps. And um, and so he said, uh, you know, we should form a Polish army with these. And actually, originally, I believe Stalin wanted the army to be part of the Soviet army as part of the Russian army. But of course, the government in exile and the British government said, no, you know, um, we're going to form a Polish army that is going to fight under the, the auspices of the of the British army. And it was decided, oh, and this part I, I really don't know because everybody was up in Siberia, but the, the army was being formed down in the Middle East, in, in Iraq, Iran, down, in, you know, in, in, in that part. So the, um, uh, it was agreed that anybody who, because actually this is, this is something why uh, the older generation have such a, a fondness for, for General Anders and and, 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 and believe him to be our savior, and he was, because he was the one who said that you have to get the women and children out as well. It's no good just the men coming out. Um, you know, you can't leave them to die and just, course, just yeah. to go off, you know, what are they fighting for? Yes. You know? yes. And it um, wasn't an so, easy negotiations with the Russians. Uh, that's right. He, yes. he, he was, uh, you know, it was a, a days of negotiations and it, it didn't really, go very well at because obviously Stalin wanted to keep all the Poles in Russia. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so anyway, uh, he did manage to get them out as long as there was somebody in the group that could that could join the army. Um, they had to let you go. Uh, and that was an interesting journey in itself. And I can tell you a little bit about my husband who also went through the same uh, thing he was he was 14 at the time when the war broke out and his sister was um, about 10 um, and um, uh, he, just as an aside because this is part of the history and it's part of, of Polish course. history it's very interesting it's why we're here so um, his Please mother tell, had, tell us the story about about your husband because I know yes. he has gone through the same way um, yes you've mentioned yes. me before but, but also he, he old... documented it as well didn't he Yes, he wrote a book. Well, he's wrote, he, he actually wrote books about Klesia, which is the part of Poland, right. um, the eastern part of Poland, which now is no longer Poland. It now is, um, it's been split between Ukraine, I believe, and Belarus. And, you know, yeah. and, and yes. Um, and, um, but anyway, his mother was actually born near Smolensk because that's where the family estates were at that time. It just shows you how far Poland stretched at one time. This goes back to the Commonwealth, and she always said she was Polish. She would never, never, although, you know, we're all Smolensk, so you're Russian. No, I'm Polish. The family was Polish. We came and 
they escaped during the Russian Revolution and they escaped to Poland at that time and she got married there and settled down there. But as soon as the Russians came in, she and her husband, my husband's father, was arrested. He was arrested immediately and they never saw him again. And they later found out he'd been shot fairly soon afterwards. Not at cutting because that was where the officers had been, who'd been arrested had mm -hmm. been shot. But there were also lots of other people who'd been arrested who got shot in other places. And she said, um, we're going to be arrested and we're probably going to be deport, you know, sent, deported to Siberia because mm -hmm. That is, you know, it happened during the times of the Tsars, it's happened during the Soviets. That's what happened. You know, the families were arrested and sent to labor camps. And unfortunately, this is what is happening now with the Ukrainians. Yes. That's what the exactly. Russians are doing. They are taking them yeah. all the way to Siberia and they yeah. are deporting them. It's exactly yes. the same Soviet yes. style system that it was yes. all the centuries ago. You know, yes, so. yes. And I must admit that when this, we heard about this war. It just came to my mind straight away, 1939 again. It just felt like 1939 again. But um, and to a certain ex extent, it is, you know, as long as we don't have an, a third world war. But, you know, for the first time in my life, this has been the only time when I've really thought possibly there could be. So we just all have to pray that there isn't. And hopefully, you know, it's gone past that point, I hope. But anyway, so. Um, uh, my my husband and and his mother and grandmother and sister were also deported um, to Siberia, as were my parents, um, because obviously being in Lvov and uh, uh, not really being from that, you know, they they were just arrested and deported as well. So I had both my parents. My aunt at that time was in prison, and she was let out of the prison when the amnesty, amnesty occurred, you know, mm -hmm. when um, when it was agreed that, 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 that the Russians would let the Poles out. So she was actually let out of prison and she made her way down and joined the, po the Polish army independently of, of my parents. So I've had sort of three different groups, family groups making their way down to Central Asia, to where the Polish army was being formed. But I'll tell you a really interesting little story about what happened with my husband. Um, when the, the Russians came, you know, it's the usual knock on the door at what, two, three in the morning, whatever it was, it was always at that sort of time. And of course you've got 15 minutes to get your things together. Although my husband's mother had already got a few things together because she was prepared for this. She, she mm -hmm. thought this was going to happen. But my husband, for some reason, um, had an alarm clock by his bed. And one of the things that he grabbed was this alarm clock. And he had no idea why he took it, but this is what happens. This is fate sometimes. And so it's an important part of the story, this alarm clock. Anyway, after they'd been let out of the camp and they had to make their way to uh, through the forest, basically, this was winter with deep snow. And it was about three days journey to get to the railway lines. I mean, you know, they were just literally let out and you, that's, go that way and you'll come to the railway lines um, line because it was a, it was a mm. single track line. Anyway, um, eventually they did get through there with my husband putting his grandmother on the sleigh and they had to stay. And the same with my parents, they had to stay overnight in these little, little, um, they were just really twigs made into, in, made like into a little tunnel that you had to slide into and build a fire at the front so that you mm. survive the night and when they got to this platform because it wasn't a proper station it was like a wooden platform with a hut on it there were quite a few bodies lying around and it, it was obvious and live people as well and it was obvious that the trains weren't stopping that you know people were not moving um and there was nothing to eat um you know um it, and people were just dying there and they really thought that they wouldn't, you know, that that would be it, that that's where they'd die. And suddenly the alarm clock went off in my husband's bag or wherever he had this alarm clock. And there was a Russian soldier and he said, what's that? He came up and said, what's that? What have you got there? What have you got there? And my husband took out this alarm clock and said, it's an alarm clock. And he, the Russian soldier had never seen one. He didn't know what an alarm clock was. And so my husband explained to him, you wind it up, it wakes you up in the morning, you know, you'll never be late and that. 
And he, the, the soldier said to him, sell it to me. And my husband said, no, I can't sell it to you because at that time, you know, that was an arrestable offence, you know, of making money on mm. things like that. But he said, I'll give it to you. If you get us onto the next train, I'll give it to you. So the next train comes along. Nobody's opening the, I mean, there were cattle trucks, basically, no trains, there were cattle trucks with sliding doors, you know, um, yeah. you've seen them on film, I'm sure. And, and, and nobody was opening the doors. They just, you know, they were so crowded in there, so squashed them anyway. The soldier went up to one of the doors and started banging on it with his, with his rifle and said, you know, open up, open up and told them who he was and that. And they opened it up a little bit. And there really wasn't a lot of, I mean, he literally pushed my husband, his mother, grandmother and his sister onto that train. I mean, Romick said that they were like this, you know, there was, mm. you, no, there was just no room, but they managed to get onto that train and he threw him the alarm clock and he closed the door behind him and they got away. But he said, if it hadn't have been for that alarm clock, they may well have just died on that platform, as a lot of people had. This so is they, amazing. This is absolutely... You know how it the is. alarm clock Great. saved his yes. life. Yes, yes. That's, that's amazing. And, and, you know... What, you know, you can't say, oh, I, he thought about it and thought, oh, this will be useful. It wasn't. It was an instinctive thing. He grabbed the alarm clock and the alarm clock sent, saved their lives. And then it was the journey down to, to um, Central Asia. It took six weeks. And, of course, you never knew where the trains were going to stop. There was no food. Uh, people were dying the whole time. And um, sadly, they had to be left, you know, just mm. by the trackside. And um, my husband's grandmother died like that, and they just had to had to leave her there. I mean, there's lots of stories that he um, I could tell you about that, but that's for another day. But he did write a book, and it was called Biawa Notsa i Chardinetnia, which is White Nights and Black uh, and Black Days. Um, uh, Why is that is, title? Because, because the White Night Biawa Notsa White Nights, because there were the, the, during the Siberia. summer. Um, in Siberia, um, yes. the sun never set, and of course the days were pretty, pretty dire. Pretty, they were black. Yes, yes. And, you know, from of terms of, I you understand. Know, they yes, had to be, yes, they had to. You know, they were working in the forest, cutting the, the yes. trees down, and that. Um, uh, so there are quite a lot of little stories in that that are really interesting. Unfortunately, it's out of print at the moment, but I think, I think you can maybe still get it as you know some some. Um, a lot of his books, most of his books are actually, because he wrote uh, afterwards, he wrote a lot of books, as I say, about Cressy, which were novels, but he also wrote two books um, and, and then afterwards about being in Palestine and his journey to England. So, um, you know, there are there were a lot of things happened on those journeys and it wasn't just to my parents and to him, all the Polish people who, they all have their stories to tell. Yeah. Each and every one has a similar story and something else that happened. I mean, my parents got separated during that journey. Again, they may never have found each other but, um, because you never knew where the train stopped. The train stopped and um, people were saying there's bread in the village there. So my father went off and, uh, you know, queued. My mother actually said that in one of the queues when they were queuing for bread, she actually slept on her feet. You know, <laughs> she was so tired. Um, uh, and they were queuing for this bread. Anyway, he came back with a loaf of bread and said, look, there wasn't even a long queue. I'm going to go and get another loaf. And he went off and of course the train moved at that moment, the train left. Oh no. And there's no timetable. There's no, well, this train is going there. Or that, and they, they could have never, never seen each other again. Yes. Yeah. And it was about, uh, I can't remember whether it was a week or two weeks later. I think it was about a week, maybe 10 days later. Um, obviously, my father got onto the next, you know, possible train, but he didn't hold out much hope of them sort of catching up or something. But as it happened, they did. His train caught up with my mother's train. Um, uh, he got out again at one of these stops where you know, don't know whether you're going to stand there for two hours or two days. Um, you know, and sometimes you were there for two days. This is why the whole journey took six weeks. Um, uh, and of course, they were letting some of the army trains go through first. And also, I mean, it was chaos. You can imagine it was chaos. Mm. But he actually met somebody from my mother's train and, and recognized him. I said, what, what, what? And he said, yeah, he said that the other train is in the next siding along. Oh. 
Oh. And he actually went and found my mother who'd got, uh, I mean, she'd been unconscious during most of that time. Now she just, she doesn't, she can't remember whether uh, she'd got a, a typhoid or whether it was just mm. the emotion of it, everything. She says she can't remember that time. Um, she'd had, you know, she was quite ill. She'd had a temperature, people were looking after her. But she said she can remember opening her eyes and seeing my father there with an apple in his hand. He'd actually found somewhere, somewhere he'd found an apple. He'd found her and he'd bought her this apple and they were back together again. Again, chance in a million that you were going to find each this other. This is what you call it. fate, really. It is this fate. Is and I wouldn't have been here if it hadn't have been for that fate. <laughs> <laughs> so... So they carried on with their journey down, down to the Middle East mm. and, you know, with, with all the young children basically died in Siberia. I mean, it was, you, you, you really had to be about seven to survive Siberia. I mean, I had a friend, I have a friend who had, um, uh, their, her parents had three children who actually died either on their way to Siberia or in Siberia. And then she and her two sisters were their second family. Mm. Again, she was born in Palestine like I was. And I will tell you now how I got to be born in Palestine. Because obviously there were all these women and children. And General Anders was, again, brilliant. You have to do something with them. And they shared the, the, the um, army uh, supplies and everything with these women and children. And he set up schools for them, even an orphanage. Um, uh, again, that's just another story where the orphans ended up in, in, in Mexico. Um, but anyway, uh, um, and the women and children, he said, um, you know, they, they've got to be looked after as well. And most of the women with children were actually sent to camps in Africa. There were quite a few camps in, in, in Africa, again, uh, because of the um, colonies, the British colonies were there. Um, so there were several of the African countries. Um, did have large camps of, of Polish women and children. And some went to India. That was just a small number of, of, of um, mothers with children who went there. Um, but the women who were pregnant at the time, and of course, you know, after, after uh, coming out of Siberia, actually getting some proper food and things, you know, women were starting to get pregnant again because, of, you know, they, they obviously weren't in Siberia. Um, Anyway, babies wouldn't have survived, so it was just as well. Um, and um, at that time, Palestine was a British protectorate. It was much nearer. So those women were actually sent to Palestine. And uh, there is a small group of us uh, who actually were born in Palestine and who lived in Palestine until 1947. Um, my father, um, because when the war finished in 1945, uh, well, he went, obviously, with the Polish forces. He went to Italy, and he was in Italy during the war. Uh, he came he came to Palestine when I was two weeks old, you know, just to see me. And then he didn't see me again until I was two. Yeah. Um, so he came to to Palestine with the, some of the Polish forces. And we actually lived in Palestine with a lovely Arab family for, for, with as a family. Before that, the, the women were living, really. They were renting... Um, uh, I don't know, I'm sure the army must have helped them, um, but they were renting room, you know, flats or whatever, apartments or whatever, I mean, they had out there, and they were living to, basically, the women were living together with their children, but there was a Polish um, a kindergarten there, there were nuns there that had been there since before the war, and they were running those, we lived in Jerusalem mainly, I mean, I think we lived in a couple of other places around Jerusalem before that, but then we ended up in Jerusalem. So. Uh, we were there until 1947, and then when the State of Israel was uh, formed, mm -hmm. yeah, and the uh, British came out of what was then um, still Palestine before Israel actually, uh, well, before the land became Israel, uh, and we came to England with the Polish army. Uh, with you know uh, the part of the army also came out because a lot of the army was still in Italy at that time but they uh, they all came to Britain and um, uh, we were put into camps um, and the camps were pretty dire really I mean there were Nissen huts there were 
I don't know if people know what Nissan huts are, but they're basically corrugated iron bent round like a half a barrel with some um, brick front and back and some foundations of brick. And we Pretty had basic. That very basic, no running water. There was a pot bellied stove in the middle. Um, you know, the toilets and all the facilities were down one of the camps that I can really remember really well because we got the Nissan hut right on the edge of the camp, which was lovely because in a way, because there were sort of fuels and things further on. But it was quite a long way from, you know, there was a standpipe, I think about, I can remember about three or four Nissan huts further down. So you could go and just get some water from the standpipe, but no toilet facilities, except for this horrible, horrible wooden hut right on the edge of the camp, which I absolutely refused to go into because you can imagine what it was like. You know? I cannot so, even, Imagine so, that, to be perfectly I mean, honest. There, yeah, I mean, there were proper toilet facilities and showers and things further into the camp, but you had to sort of go down there. And I can remember walking into that Nissan hut and um, there were three army, metal army beds, you know, the lockers, the army lockers. There were three of those. There was a trestle table and there was some um, uh, army blankets. And that was that was it. Um and obviously, my my mother had bought some sort of things from from Palestine, and but in, in packing case, packing cases were used for everything. They were they were wooden packing cases, like tea chests, but but strong because they were actually tea chests seemed to be made of um of, of uh, like plywood, but these this were proper proper wood, and you could use it for all sorts of things. And she actually managed, as did all the other women there, because obviously we weren't the only ones. Um, uh, uh, they actually made them into homes and it was surprisingly how quickly how quickly they became a home um, and uh, you know they cook for, for, for Vigilia and all sorts of things my mother would do Deba Fasha Rovana which is like sort of I suppose like a bit like a falca fish you know but you stuff it into the um, in, 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 in those sort of circumstances, it was amazing what, 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 what the women did there. It's just amazing how people could survive at uh, very little and have um, yes. still very fulfilling life. Um, yes. I have to be brutal, um, Elisabetta, Elis because we've got virtually uh, two and a half minutes left now. Uh, okay. It is so fascinating. I didn't want to disturb you before, but uh, I think that the story that you know we were after, uh, specifically that Anders' story, you know, the, the the going through, you know, you you wonderfully yes. described this. It was a combination of luck and a combination of totally uh, unexpected events that nobody could potentially prepare for. Um, yes. And the story with the uh, the alarm clock is just amazing, <laughs> yes. I must say. Um, so I uh, thank you so much for this. Um, yes. uh, by the way, I don't know. But if you just know... quickly about Ognisko, because Ognisko yes, is very of much part of the uh, Anders story. Before you story. say that, I also would like to recommend everybody to read the book Trail of Hope, which is available in the Polish shops uh, around yes. the UK. And that is an amazing story uh, of the Anders Army. It's called the Anders Army Odyssey Across Three Continents by Professor Norman Davis. And this is uh, um, one of those books that um, it's a must to read if for anyone who, who doesn't know. And it does give you story. the history. It Absolutely. will give you the history. I can tell you personal stories, as can a lot of other people. And, uh, um, and there are a lot of personal stories. And maybe at some point you can do a little program. We can do another the, interview, the, probably. The person, all, and we can... all, lots and lots of stories. That will <laughs> we can really talk about the stories probably yes. all night. But, but that one with no, yes. <laughs> At the yeah, moment. But Norman Davis gives you the background, gives you the yes. historical background and gives you and then our stories will fit into that beautifully. Of course, of course. So please tell us now, uh, just to summarize, um, what do you do now in Ognisko? Because this is also the place well, where the, it's connected just to the very, war. very quickly. The history of Ognisko is the history that we've been telling you about just before the war. There was talk about having a, a Polish house because there were quite a lot of painters and and writers and people like that in in uh, uh, in London at that time. The war broke out and it was decided that what they needed was to have somewhere for the Polish forces to meet. And fifty five exhibition road at some point turned up. Um, and, uh, and remember the, this address for everybody. Fifty five. Absolutely. Unfortunately, we are finishing road. now, Elizabeth. Yeah. Sorry to okay. say that, but uh, I don't. Not want at all. To... 
if um, people want to know more about your much. school go on to our website Please, and you'll see absolutely. the history there and we will advertise this website on our our uh, polish yes. as well thank you so much and fascinating well, thank you very story. much and thank and you very Vieta. much for listening to the story thank you, thank you. bye bye goodbye